I feel better now that Mike Kent just got here. I feel a lot better. How you feeling, brother? Mike, feeling better, brother? Mike, how you feeling, brother? How you feeling? No, I'm really stronger, faster, and better than Mike Kent. You hear that? No, you said he couldn't hear it, brother. I know he's done the weather here since last Thursday or Friday, so be to pray for him and uh, be praying for the Mike Green as well. He's not coming well too, but thank you, man, for being here. At this time, I've asked uh, Dr. Thurman Wade to come. He's the uh, general director of Mass Sony Missions here uh, in Georgia, and I know he's here for years, years, and years. I have to come up and say free for everyone to do tonight for our business conference tonight, Brother Wade. And you come on and you let God have his way in your life, Brother Wade. Come on, hey. Amen. I hope you're on. Yeah. Thank you. Say hello, world. Hey. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, he just didn't have one. Takes a lot more volume than used to for me. He used to have a built in and speaking, you know. But uh, time takes its toll. I want to say I'm glad to be here tonight. I don't know if I've ever been in better to be here somewhere than I am tonight. Amen. I can make it three hours on three and five. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm saved. Right. And if I weren't, I don't want to be saved. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be nice. But of all the years I've been coming here, this is not I told someone I'm this is the worst trip I've ever had. Don't oh, that here. It's not locked down. And then when you got to the bathroom, that's worse. Yeah. <laughs> and then you start praying, and that's what's worse. <laughs> You'll get that. <laughs> I'll tell you, God is good. Yeah. Wonderful Savior. Yeah. Wonderful Lord. The same today as he was yesterday. Right. And the more thing about it, he's going to be the same tomorrow. Right. So it doesn't matter how old I am, he's still more. Hey, he's still my Savior. Hey. Well, I pray that this church will go forward. Appreciate you inviting me and inviting and asking me to come and be here tonight. And uh, I trust that we'll be a good conference. And I can remember this. I can remember this, say this. So these many years, we've seen God do some wonderful things. <laughs> And the way we're conditioned. And I appreciate those years that I've been able to come. This may be the last year. In fact, the Lord may come. He may come as a service ago. He may come as a week ago. And the way things are looking, that's the best thing to happen. Yes, sir. It's great to the same. Yeah. But if you're not saved, that'd be the worst thing to happen. Yeah. Right. And I just pray that you all be ready when he, when he comes. I'm glad my wife could come with me. She kind of helped me down a little bit. Now what uh, traffic? And, and hey, the thing about it is, when I got when I got off of 80, uh, 285 on the five seven on the six seventy five, it was stopped again. <laughs> and then when uh, when I got over here, the first time this ever happened, got on this road. This road. Guess what? No, they actually had to do it all. What? They had to turn around and go all the way back. You know, all the way back. You know, all the way So I hope I'll have a little more robot tonight. So uh, if you'll turn with me in your Bible, I'll be as brief as I can here for that tonight. What else that's going to do? But uh, in Matthew chapter number 9, very familiar scripture. But I've been thinking about this. And it really is. When I think about missions, I think about faith on the giving is a great reason for us to do that. And why should we continue to do it? Why should it not be the same every year in increase in giving? I just finished the conference up in Virginia and uh, I've been born there several years. And just a small country church. I mean a real out in the country church. Very small. But what God's done in that handful of people has been one of the most amazing experiences I've had in, in the ministry, along the mission. And all those years in pastor, I realized such a wonderful, wonderful work of God in the hearts of men and women. 
But uh, last year, uh, they, they, they run anywhere from 65 to 70 to Sunday school. Part of them bus in. And uh, every year they've increased their faith promise. And uh, it's been late. Last year, their faith promise was, I believe, it was 98,000. And uh, this year, I thought that well, because of the way it is, I don't guess there'd be much, you know, increase. And if that's true, if you depend on the numbers, it probably won't happen. But the faith promise was left 111,000. And the process of these years that I've been going there, they have built a gymnasium, three profit chamber, nice little motel room in the other city. Bought up almost 100 acres of land to build a board ranch. They're going to build a tabernacle on the place they were promised to build a cabin house. And I, I said, what in the world is going on here? I said, so how can this thing be? Now, of course, I ought to know that. But they said, go away. Central Baptist Church understands faith from the giving. Uh, yeah. Amen. Amen. If you understand that, see, God doesn't change. Uh, and I think the key that we miss in this matter of giving is we fail to really get God's will. I mean, pray giving God's will in what He's had you to do. Because if He lays it upon your heart and mouth, He will be sure to do what He said He would. Right. If I assume that the whole time I have an income right now, and I can give more, and I give more without God telling me how much to give, then I ask my responsibility to come up with some way somehow. And usually that's the faith. Amen. Yeah. And so I the key is find the will of God. Right. You say, well, well, well what if the economy if the economy fails? And if if you can't if you lose your job or well, you don't earn as much. We're not talking about that, we're talking about faith promise. Right. Right. Yeah. Faith promise is not based upon your income. Right. It's not based on your income. Yeah. Yeah. If that is that's a budget type of giving. Right. Your tithe may change in the amount. Well, it's, right. it, it's based upon what? The amount of income. Right. But if you if you so therefore that may that may change. But if your faith promise is based upon what God has laid on your heart and you trust trust Him, He will not fail. Hey. Right. He yeah. cannot fail. Amen. When I first started missions years ago, I, I preached at the conference and I heard somebody say, many years, and I, by, by name, some people here don't know what I'm talking about. Said, now you ask God how much He wants to give, and if God doesn't bring it in, you don't know what we have to give. I, sound, I understand that sounds reasonable, you know. If it's from a human standpoint, I'd be reasonable. But if God lays it on your heart and He doesn't bring it in, God fail. Yeah. Yeah, am I right? Uh, if He doesn't do what He said He'd do, and that's you do, He fails. Sure. Hey, you said, brother, what about that? That means praise God, I got a wonderful Savior. Right. I got an Almighty God. Right. He, his action and His power is not based upon man's ability, right. but upon God's ability. Yeah. Amen. Well, I was one of them. Good, Amen. 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 But I pray that you'll you'll trust the Lord and believe and let him and what a great thing. What greater time to prove God is able than when you that. Right. Amen. Right. I mean if I'm walking around doing fine, I don't need God. Right. I think. And all the time God is back to what time. But if I'm trusting the Lord, then I can't fail. Because he cannot. But I said, I, I, when I start out, I didn't even go that route, but, but I just thought, I'll throw that in. <laughs> no extra question. No extra But I want to say this. Why do I want to be involved in faith promise? Why a church? And why evangelism? Why missionary? Why do this? Look at this scripture. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 38. Therefore, and, excuse, excuse me, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages. Now these are the towns and villages that all around Galilee. Teaching their teaching in their synagogue. Of course, you wouldn't you'd be ostracized if you were 
Sunday by Sunday, I'm going to be preaching with But Jesus can go where he wants to go. Right. He didn't know where to worry about the prison. Jesus worried about all the sinners and finished his teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom. Now there's a gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the grace of God. They're not speaking of the gospel, but there's two aspects of the same gospel. And healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And then in verse 36 he says, But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad, as sheep having no shepherd. Then said the unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenty, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Three amazing verses of scripture from 36 through 38. There's a song that says, Must I go and empty hand? Must I meet my dear Savior? Not one soul with which to greet him. Must I empty hand? And the title of this message is this, Must I Go With the Hand? I tell you, mission is important. Right, right. I don't want to face my Savior into Him. Right, hey. I want to have at least one precious soul that I can face Him with, hey. that I have some part in winning Him to the Savior. Amen. Hey. I want to do that. And at Luke 16, uh, excuse me, 13, Luke 13. Jesus is speaking to a group of people. And he makes a statement. That because there was some there present at the season that, that told him of the Galileans whose <coughs> blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice. And Jesus answered and said unto them, supposing that these Galileans were the sinners of all, above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things. That's a question mark. He said, Nay, I tell you, but except you repent, you shall all lack my Or those 18 upon whom the tower saw long fell and slew them, think you that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, Nay, but except you repent, you shall all lack my parents. What do you say, brother? And I'm saying, friend, people that are all are lost. There are no maybe in between the higher up and the lower, or, but the ground around the cross is left right. and and the And sometimes I, I wonder if we really realize and still remember what the Lord had to say about lost people. We think about somebody lost overseas, but what about the people who are lost in the And so when I think about the scripture, I think about the lost. Just how lost are the lost? How lost are they? Well, I believe the lost sinner is lost as lost can be. And I don't care who that person is, if it's in my family, my own children. We think about Hitler was, oh, he, he deserved, I've heard people say, he deserved to go to hell. Mussolini deserved to go to hell. Or some of them not deserved to go to hell. He's a murderer. <coughs> We can say that, but did you know that my child, your child, is lost as they are? Yeah. Until they're saved with the grace of God. Right. Amen. Amen. That cute little, sweet little girl, my wife and I have a daughter, three sons, and then a whole bunch of grandsons, right. and grandchildren, and great grandchildren. But every one of them, until they come to save the Savior, they're lost. And they go to the same place as these wicked, that we would say wicked sinners. Yeah. Yes, they're lost overseas. They're lost in Haiti. They're lost in Germany. Lost in Italy. But they're lost. But they're lost in Georgia. And they're lost in people in Italy. The darkest of Africa. Those places, bleak places, the longest river of Amazon. People in these jungles. They're savages, we say. They're savages. They're awful. They're terrible. But I tell you, the person in the pew next to you, if he's lost, is lost in that native in Africa. Uh -huh. And when Jesus saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion. Uh -huh. That changes the picture, doesn't it? 
We can look at the world in its condition. We can look at sinners as they are. We can consider the bad people, the good people, the men and the men. And some of them call us that their, their children are good children. They think somehow they're going to be all right. That's a, that is what St. Motion is doing right. It's to be careful right. and concerned and say, well, maybe they will be. That's why the old-fashioned worship of God that our forefathers would fall on their face at the old mourner's bed and their knees in the solace tray. Amen. Go down on the floor and pray for their children and would mourn and weep and pray and work until they were saved. Sometimes couldn't sleep at night until they were saved. Because they realized that they were lost is lost to be. Amen. Amen. And so they sat on their knees until they were saved with the grace of God. There are many times I've seen when I first started passing in 1956, we had, we, we had, the air conditioning was the one where the window. Because we had a screen on the window. No screen on the door. But when the summertime got hot, you had to open the window. Amen. Yeah. And I remember, and we didn't have central heat either. We had a big pot belly that stove right in the front of the pulpit of all places. We put it right in front of the pulpit. Well, I had to look around the cold stove back to see me. <laughs> and I get so hot, my eyes with water and sweat, and I couldn't probably see the people. Well, that's good. I'll pray for God. I just like there's a bridge up here. Who's there? Amen. But I couldn't tell who's there. <laughs> but in the meantime, some of those bugs entered the ministry. Amen. So, but the thing about it is we had slats. We didn't have any cover on the pew. We didn't have any carpet on the floor. <laughs> but we had some old time meetings. Yeah. Yeah. They'd pack the place down and raise the windows and we'd get all from outside. I've had people walk from the outside in to get something. Got them from the out of the yard. That's pretty good. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, has God changed? No, he not changed. He still wants a place. Yeah. Well, an old fashioned <laughs> I like to call brother, brother Allison, I like to call mission revival, not mission comfort, but mission revival. Right. Because if you get revived, you will have mission. Right. Out of every great revival we've ever known of in history, dear friend, Albert came labor and worker, right. yeah. missionary, amen. amen. The great whale of revival called the great evangelism and zeal of the people. Yeah. And it calls them, they sent a reporter over from England over to uh, Scotland. To find out what was going on and where was revival. Well, this guy didn't know what revival was. He didn't know where to look. So he walked up to a policeman on the street and said, Sir, where's revival? He said, Right here. Yeah. Amen. Right here. It starts in my heart. Yeah. I'm going to reach the world. We have a way of doing it. God has given us a program and a plan in His Word where we, whereby we can have all the finances we need to reach the world with the God of Jesus Christ. Now we need it later. Did you know I found, brother, over these many years, that the getting the mission field has not been the problem of finance. It's been a problem of failure of faith in God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And God will split. Well, I'm going to share just a few words with you. I'll be I want you to keep this outline, and you can work on the later. I believe that when Jesus said this, when he saw the multitude, he was talking about souls of men. Win the lost at any cost. He was talking about soul. So, what, and, and because he said the multitude, he was talking about a large harvest. Yeah. Because in the scripture, he talks about the harvest. Been, been plenty, but the labor of the people. <coughs> so, the large harvest. And, the, and because there are souls that have to do with the condition, the position, and the relationship of the people concerning what the, what the gospel is all about, is plenty. Did you know that in the days, when Jesus was on the earth, that there were only uh, just a little over 300 million of people. But did you know now there was over 7.4 7 billion of people on the earth? And the three largest nations in the world is China, India, and the United States. There's, over, there's more people in the United States than work on more in the world than Jesus. When he said that the harvest was plenty, if it was plenty of it, they might how plenty it is today. Right. And if the labor is few in his day, how few it is today. Although there may be more people, more missionaries, more people, more churches than ever before, yet because of teeming millions of people, there is still a shortage of labor. Right. We still need labor. And so I want 
all over the east. Look at look at the perishing of the past. In the first part of the 29th century. It's like a weaver show. Cotton mill. Job 7 and 6. It's like a swift post, like a post that comes and drops a mill and drives off. It's swift. That's what our life is like. It's like the span of a man's hand, Psalm 39, 5, and a shepherd's tent, Isaiah 30, 12. A store was told in Psalm 99, and Steve and James and the vapor is to hear no. The brevity of the human life. And we know that people die of all ages. So, first of all, the condition of the soul is the imperative. Secondly, the imperative. That soul is in peril. I mentioned the fact that the law, that means in peril. That means they're facing a little burning hell yeah. without mercy any further. It's the point of this one that wants to die after death is the judgment. And as death finds, that's the way the judgment finds. They're in peril. In peril. Now, if you just died and the just wants you to believe, you're just a body and you lay the ground, that's, that's the end of it all. No. No, you won't live on some of that. And uh, so it's in peril. But oh, I like that. Because when he saw the woman, he was moved to pass. So not only perishing in peril, but the oppression. Oh, the oppression. That's why I don't want to go empty hand. They're worth all the money in the world. They're worth every bit of effort. Believe it or not, they're worth driving down to 85. Yeah, yeah. Right. Hey. Trying to get to church. Right. They're worth what we can do. They're worth the time it takes to pray and get the will of God about the mission. I believe, Brother Mike, that this church, that any church, and that have the children of God in them, remember, I believe that what we have to do is get the will of God and God will take your way. Are. But it may take some time and, and, and trouble on our part to really spend some time in prayer. Our pastor just introduced what he calls 31 days of prayer, starting the 7th of October to the 7th of November. If we ever need to pray for a nation, we need to pray now. So I'll throw that in there. But uh, the larger the soul. But there's a sadness. The sadness of this part is the lateness. He said, say not you yet for once then come the harbor, look the lips of God, look on the field for that white already. Yes. Already. Now, we can't wait to listen. If if we wait until the seas will calm, no, no more cloud, the sun is shining to do what God has. Then those first seven missionaries who left America in 1804, going overseas to Europe, if they had looked at the conditions because they were going to war in Europe. They would never sail. Right. But, but thank God John, that they did go. Yeah. And so we're saved and churches were established. And the work was done because these men were willing to go. And obedience to call of God on their life. And so there's a lateness of the harvest. And there's a scarceness of our labor of the few. There's a sacredness of the harvest. And that is, dear friend, the precious liability of this hour. But lastly, I like to read verse, read verse number 38. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he'll send full labor in his harvest. Who? The Lord of the harvest. Yes. Not only the large of the harvest, so sadness, the lateness of it, and the scarcity of the labor, the sacredness of the ability, but the sovereignty, the Lord of the harvest. According to Revelation 14, if we, if we do not reap, He will reap. He will put in His sickle. He'll reap the harvest of the world. But it'll be too late. One book about it'll be too late. Now is the time to put everything we can and be able to stand before Him one day. Not in the hand. It's a precious soul. Amen. Amen. I don't want to pray, but I want to say this, that I, I thank the Lord for the opportunity I've had to kneel by some precious soul and lead that soul to Jesus. Yeah. You go knock on the door and find a man there with a the Bible open and said, Preacher, was this one that I said here? I wish somebody had me understand what I mean. Right. Oh, what a privilege. Hey. What a privilege to take the Word of God and pray with Him. And see him come to Jesus Christ. Amen. His wife got saved first. 
But he got saved shortly after that, in that same evening. That dear one is still living for the Lord. Oh, if I could just take, take him, oh Mark, and say, Lord, here he is. This is the only one I've ever lived with. This is the one I'll never leave to you. He said with me. And hear him say, Well done. Yeah. Now be well done. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Appreciate the privilege. May God bring some peace to us.
Now you can sit down. Okay. You can sit down. Okay, good. All right. Let's get you up and down a little bit. Okay. And uh, again, I uh, do appreciate Dr. Wade coming and doing that part. This time, my family is going to sing a song for us.
appreciate you being here. It's good to see Dr. Wade. Uh, I prayed for him all these years. I, I think I met uh, Dr. Wade uh, years ago in the early 1970s at, uh, at Tennessee Temple when he came to Larry Creek. I was a student uh, back then. I was only two years old, if you're already counting. <laughs> Concealed carry permit. 
I looked at her and asked if she had a weapon in her possession at the time. Language, uh, maybe, or just the way she said it made me want to ask if she had any other firearms. She did admit to having uh, also a 9mm Glock in her center console. <laughs> now, I had to ask one more time if that was all. She responded once again that she did have just one more, a 38 Special, in her purse. I then asked her what she was uh, so afraid of. She looked me right in the eye and said, not a thing. <laughs> uh, she, she knew how to keep from being afraid. <laughs> All right, had nothing to do with the message, but uh, I thought you might want to hear about that. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, if you would. I have been waiting um, all uh, the time to get to this uh, passage. Uh, on, um, on Sunday morning, we begin the conference and we told you in the Sunday school hour that we would be uh, speaking about the ministry of missions given this week. And uh, in Sunday school, we looked at some things that the Bible says uh, overall about giving. We talked about the first offering, the, the uh, free will offering. Uh, the first offering being, of course, the tithe. It's the first offering that we learn to give after we get saved. And uh, then the free will offering, over and above the tithe, and then the faith offering. And uh, then uh, we call that the preliminary discernments of missions given. On Sunday morning, yesterday morning, in the morning worship hour, we went to 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 and 11, and Paul said there, we're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And then uh, he said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord will <coughs> persuade me. And we brought a message on the persuaded diligence of missions. And we looked at several things that ought to persuade us to involve ourselves in that great work of world evangelization. And then uh, on the last evening, we brought a message on what we call the personal duties of uh, missions. And uh, we saw uh, from 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, and just uh, as a jump-off place uh, about the, the matter of giving to the work of God, and not grudgingly or necessity for God loveth a cheerful giver. And we brought a message on some personal duties. What are we to give? Uh, we're to give ourselves. We're to give our service. And uh, we are to give our sons. And uh, then uh, we're to give our substance. As we give uh, our, uh, our uh, uh, selves and missions, uh, that speaks to us about the consecration of that ministry. And as we give our service, that speaks about the consideration of what God wants us to do about that ministry in the service of the Lord. And as uh, we give our sons, uh, that speaks to us about the continuation of the mission ministry. If we don't give our sons to go, uh, these older missionaries are going to have to come home and there won't be a mission program uh, after that if we don't give our sons to go. And then the, to give our substance, the commitment to that ministry. And we tried to emphasize those truths last evening. Now, uh, tonight, I want us to look uh, the first five verses of this tremendous uh, chapter, and I'm going to bring a message tonight on what I call the practical demonstration of missions giving. And if you have found your place, and if you're able to, I'll ask you to stand and give attention to the Word of God. Enjoy the message Dr. Wade brought. In fact, uh, I wrote it down on the back of my faith promise card here. And, uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, people will hear that again somewhere down the road. If, if he don't preach it anymore, uh, I know somebody that might do that. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but thank you, Dr. Wade, and I appreciate that challenge. Now, 
Uh, if you look at with me, uh, beginning in verse number one, and we'll uh, talk about this uh, a little more detail in just a moment. But uh, chapter 8, verse 1, the Bible says, Moreover, brethren, we do, uh, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty, that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, or the Lord hope means expecting. Paul said, I was just expecting them to give a, an offering. He said, uh, but uh, they, they uh, gave uh, their own selves first. They gave the, their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Now, uh, Paul said that uh, they, uh, I was expecting to give just an, uh, an offering, but they did something beyond that. They gave their own selves. And I want us to think this evening about the practical demonstration of missions giving. Paul said, I want you to witness something here. And we'll look at that in just a moment. Now, Father, open our hearts. Thank you for speaking to us already through the Word of God. Thank you, dear God, for the Myers being in the conference tonight. Thank you for these precious people who've uh, come out and turned their steps to the house of God this evening through the rain just to hear the Word of God. Lord, thank you for speaking to our hearts through the message of Dr. Wade. Now, help thy servant tonight. Lord, I need you. And speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We notice in Sunday school, Sunday morning, in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, uh, that there Paul established the policy of faith promise giving. And we talked about that and how that when he said, now concerning the collection for the saints, he didn't say a collection from the saints. That would have been the tithe. But he said this is a collection for the saints. For those saints who are ministering in some other part of the world. It was the missions offering that Paul was talking about. And uh, he said now, as uh, I have given order uh, to the churches of Galatia, he said as we went across Galatia, planting those churches and establishing those churches, he said that uh, we, we gave uh, the order, we set in order. In other words, they set up a system of giving, uh, a collection for the saints. They set up a missions program in the, those churches is what Paul was saying. And then he said this. He said that, Corinth, even so do ye. What you need to do over there in Corinth is to set this type of giving up in the church. Well, Oh, Paul goes over to Macedonia. Churches like 
of Philippi. That's a Macedonian church. Thessalonica was a Macedonian church. Berea, a Macedonian church. And, and, and he went over there in those churches and he said, folks, I won't tell you what they, what they did over in court. Glory to God. I wish you'd have been in that conference over there in the church at Corinth. They, they got so excited about giving commissions and, and, and they made a they promised commitment and, and, and boy, they're going to give commissions and, and, and they got all excited about that. They said, well, praise God, Paul, if that crowd over there in Corinth can do it, pass us out some of them they promised cards. And let us have a part. Now, again, you've got to read between the lines, get that, but that, that basically, they wanted to get involved in it. Now, here's what happened. The churches at Macedonia made the same type of commitment that the church at Corinth had made. But there was one difference. The churches of Macedonia gave theirs. And a whole year has gone by now. And the church at Corinth has done blessed nothing about giving them that uh, missions offering that they committed to give. Now, what is happening in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, Paul is writing back to the church of Corinth, and he's reminding them that they had made a sacred commitment to God, and that they needed to, 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 to fulfill uh, that commitment that they had made. And so he begins here, if you notice, uh, by giving the illustration of the churches of Macedonia. Now, Paul established the policy of missions given in, in 1 Corinthians 16, but then in chapters 8 and 9, he be, uh, begins to explain the procedure of it. And that's what I want us to look about, look at the rest of this week, uh, how that Paul explained how that it's to be done. Now, the churches of Macedonia, they made the same commitment, but yet they gave their and Paul is saying in verse 1, now I want you to witness something, he said. I want you to witness the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. And then in the next few verses, uh, verses 1 through 5, or actually chapter, uh, or verses 2 through 5, uh, Paul gives four truths about the Macedonian vision. Now, Paul, or the, the Macedonian giving. Now, now, watch this if you would. I want you to see something here. He said, now, here's the way they did it. They got on the bandwagon because of you, boy. And they gave birth. And I want you to witness how the grace of God was bestowed upon them. And that they were able to give their commitment. I thought it was ironic that Paul was using the example of the poorest of all the churches to challenge the richest of all the churches that Paul dealt with. But you know, I see that still today. I see big churches and rich churches. Uh, they've got plenty of money. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the, the largest amounts of money given to missions in the independent Baptist circles are those of smaller churches. 200 or less. You heard Dr. Wade Cook say a while ago about, uh, talk about that church up in Virginia. 60, 70 people giving over $100,000 to, to missions. Yeah. I preach a conference in the church over in, uh, in uh, Morganton, North Carolina every year. Uh, for, uh, have for the last 20 years or so until this past year. And uh, they, uh, they had 35 church members. They'd give over $50,000 every year. Because they promised, they got a hold of that truth of giving. You see, and and uh, I heard a statistic recently uh, that said that uh, that uh, eighty percent of all missions given in, in in independent Baptist circles are done is done uh, from uh, churches running two hundred or less. And uh, you know, uh, 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 seemingly tortured, and those are the ones going to have they promise. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, uh, exhort the people to give and give the opportunity to people to give. And Paul said, now look here, Corey. I want you to see a living demonstration of how it's done. And then in the next four verses, in verse 2, he gives four things about the Macedonian giving. Number one, 
You notice the priority of their giving. Look at it, verse 2. Heaven in a great cloud of affliction. The abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. Now, these folk refused to allow anything to deter them from giving what they told the Lord that they were going to do. It was their priority to do it. If you look, and I'm just going to rough run by this uh, for just a little while. If you look at it, uh, they gave in spite of their problems. They were in a, a, a time, it says, a, a great trial of afflictions. Uh, they, they were just experiencing afflictions. Brother, uh, they were going through a great trial of afflictions. I mean, it was one trial after another. They were experiencing hard times after hard times. But in spite of all of that, they refused to allow that to deter them uh, from doing what they told God that they were going to do. Now let me ask you something. Is that the attitude of the average believer today? You know it's not. When hard times come, usually the first thing they do is quit giving to God and, and get out of church and not serve God. That's the worst thing they could do. Not so with the Macedonians. They gave in spite of the problems. But notice secondly, they gave in spite of their poverty. He calls it here deep poverty. And, and it literally means rock bottom destitution. I believe it was Dr. Ward Wearsby that I was uh, reading his commentary the other day on this. And, uh, he said that uh, this word, uh, deep poverty, uh, means uh, it, it's describing a, a beggar with absolutely nothing and has no hope of getting anything. That's what that word, po deep poverty, means. It wasn't just poverty. Hey, they weren't just poor people. They were extremely poor people. I mean, these people were so poor that poor people call them poor, amen? Uh, but yet, they didn't allow that to keep them from giving to the world of God. Again, does that describe the average church member today? No, you know it doesn't. When there's not enough money for the month, the first thing you do is quit giving to God. And that's the worst thing that they are. Uh, I know what it's like to be poor. I, I was poor. I, I was coming up, uh, I grew up on a, uh, my first eight years. I lived out in the country in uh, Upper Spartanburg County, South Carolina. And uh, we lived out on a farm. We, we were poor, but, but we didn't know we were poor. Everybody around us was poor. We didn't think anything about it. We grew our own vegetables and we canned them. Uh, we had an old cow that we milked twice a day for our milk, and, and I learned how to milk uh, uh, that cow before I started the school. Uh, man, I got so good at that thing, I could uh, knock a fly off the barn wall. Uh, I, I knew how to, anybody ever milked a cow? Yeah, oh, yeah, there people that. You know what I'm talking about. We, we had, uh, we, we killed uh, a hog every year. In fact, uh, we killed two hogs uh, a year. Uh, and I well remember uh, the day after Thanksgiving, back in those days, uh, weather patterns have changed uh, some now, but back in those days, uh, it, it was cold, uh, Thanksgiving, by Thanksgiving it was cold in South Carolina. And uh, uh, um, that was hot kidding time, the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, I mean, old Tom Turkey hadn't got settled real good uh, from the Thanksgiving meal, the, uh, till uh, early morning, uh, uh, Friday morning after Thanksgiving, uh, Pa would shoot that uh, hog in the head. And uh, when I'd get out there, Granny already had a big fire under that big pot. And I had that hog strung up on, on a tree limb and uh, scalding that baby down. And if I ever killed a hog, it, oh, you know what I'm talking about, Sipper, Brother David, you, you kill a hog. And man, dude, uh, cut that baby open and, uh, you know, get that good lard out of it and, and them good chitlins out of it. Hey, Amen. Uh, anybody ever eat any chitlins? Most people don't admit that. What if they told me he really 
they enjoyed eating chitlins till they found a piece of corn in one. <laughs> themselves on the, their collard greens uh, and, uh, and and I always thought collard greens had an odor to it when they when they cooked and uh, I love to eat them but uh, I don't like the smell of when they're cooking uh, and this lady we were eating supper in her home one night she had been cooking chickens and collard greens on the same stove First time in my life I ever saw flies trying to get out of the house. <laughs> I, wonder, I had a friend, uh, his name was George Ham. He's with the Lord now, but uh, George was from West Virginia. And uh, he said that when he first started preaching, that uh, he was preaching a brush harbor meeting on the other side of the mountain from where he was born and raised. And he said that uh, when the, the uh, uh, he got up to preach the first night. He said, uh, folks, you won't have any problem remembering my name at all. Just remember the best part of the hog, and you got it. After the service, the lady came to him and said, Brother Chilly, I believe that was the best sermon I ever heard. <laughs> that was the best part I guess you heard. I never could find myself to eat those things. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. My daddy used to love hog brains. You about ever eat brains and eggs? Man, I, I, he loved them things. And he thought everybody ought to love them. And boy, I couldn't stand that. We'd get up early in the morning and the kids were getting ready to go to school and my daddy cooking breakfast and he had the hog brains and scrambled eggs. He had that often. And I just couldn't bring myself. He loved it, didn't he, man? Uh, we were poor, but everybody else was poor. That's what I'm talking about. And, and that describes these people here. They didn't have anything, but they refused to allow that to keep them from doing what they told God that they were going to do. That was their priority. Let me say this, and I'm not going to Number two, I want you to notice the power of their giving. Look at verse 3. For to their power I bear record, yea, be all their power, they were willing of themselves. They gave to their power what they could do. Uh, and you got the ability to give to your power. To, you, you can write a check for every dime you've got in the bank tonight. And you've got the power to do it. You have the ability to just write a check, put it in the altar plate, and, and, and you can do that. You have the power to do it. But once these people had given everything they had, they still had a holy desire that they wanted to do more. You know what? God granted their request and allowed them to give beyond their power. Giving to their power is what they could do. Giving beyond their power is what they could not do. Now, uh, brother, it's one thing to give what you have. Give what you got. It's another thing to give what you don't got. And if you go to give it what you do not have, you had better get some faith involved. And that's exactly what happened with uh, this man uh, here in, uh, in the, the Macedonian churches. I don't think it, uh, it would take too much power for me to reach back here and pick this little five-pound stand up over my head and take it down that aisle and set it out there in the parking lot. Nobody would applaud me for doing that. You know why? A 220 pound preacher ought to be able to pick that little old five pound stand up without any problem at all. I've got the ability to do that. Now, I want to tell you something, friend. If I reach over here and grab hold that piano, hoisted that thing up over my head with one hand, that raised my eyebrows. You know why? I don't have the power to do that. You got the power to do that. I don't have the power to do that. You would, if you saw me do that, you would conclude that this preacher's got some unseen help somewhere because we don't have the power to do it. Now, this is what Paul is saying here. That that's what they promise in a nutshell. Instead of trying to figure it out for ourselves, uh, we live. And say, Lord, I won't take it out of my little old realm of what I can do. Lord, I, I can't figure it out. I know what I have coming in. I know what I have going out. And, 
Mission is offered to the Lord. That's what he's talking about. You'll see as you read through the whole of text that they gave with passion. For they were glad that they could do it. I'll tell you, my friend, given ourselves is absolutely imperative that we're going to be used of God in missions given. I don't know of a better way to end this service tonight than just giving ourselves afresh to the Lord. I uh, heard a story told not uh, long ago about a uh, missionary that uh, in Africa went up the Congo River uh, and had the natives to natives to, 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 to canoe him up over there. And, and uh, they traveled for two or three days. And as they were going by a turn in the river, uh, there was a village on the banks of the river there. The missionary said, this is where I want to go. So they went in there and befriended the village chief and and uh, he got permission to preach, and they gathered them together, and he preached to them, and many were saved, and the old chief got saved. And uh, he stayed with them for several months, and he started a church. And he taught them a whole lot of things about the church, and about the doctrines, and so forth. He taught them about missions, and how that they're to branch out and give so that others can and go and take the gospel to others in different parts of, uh, of the world. And the time came when they were going to receive their missions offering. He talked about how to give the missions and so forth. And on this uh, service, they came in bringing their ducks and their uh, uh, geese and their chickens and their eggs and uh, just everything that, that they could bring as a missions offering, uh, a gift to the Lord. And what the girl, 14 years old, brought her offering in a rusty old tin can and laid it on the altar and went back to her seat. And the, the, the fellows who were in charge of taking the offerings, they recognized that it was uh, money. And they quickly counted the money. And it was the equivalent of $86 as we would know it today. That was a year's wage. And they uh, called her back up and asked her where she got the money. A 14-year-old girl shouldn't have no money. At first, she wouldn't tell them. But they, they, they coerced her to tell them. Finally, she told them with, with, with a broken heart what that little 14-year-old girl had done. She said everybody was giving their offering. I didn't have anything to give. That little girl went out and sold herself to be a slave for the rest of her life so she could bring her mission off to God. <laughs> now, that is a vivid illustration of giving yourself. God may never ask you to do something like that. Oh, but he wants us to give ourselves to him in total dedication. I have a fellow in the conference not long ago to stand up and testify about faith promise giving. He said, I was in church for years. He said, I taught Sunday school class. I was a deacon. I was a faithful church member for years. But he said, I never would give the mission. No, he said, I'd give a dollar here and a dollar there. I, I wouldn't make a commitment to give. He said, but one day, he said in a service, and he said, it just totally unexplainable what happened. He said, but God got a hold of my heart. And he said, I went to the altar and I saw myself as what I was, was just an old hypocrite. He said, I've uh, done this and done that and done the other church, but I was just an old hypocrite. He said, I confess that sin to God with a broken heart. And he said, God changed me rapidly. He said, I couldn't wait till the next missions conference, and I got that car and filled it out. And he said, now for many years, it's been my joy to, to give more and more and more to missions. You know what the difference was? <laughs> he got committed. He got committed to Christ. And I'll tell you, my friend, once we give ourselves to him, then 
we want to do what we can to reach the world with the gospel. The practical demonstration of faith promise giving, Paul said, I want you to witness the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. We'll pick up there in verse 6 tomorrow night. We'll go just a little farther. I don't know of a better way to end this meeting just to make our way to this altar. And I, I'm here tonight in my heart. And I'm saying, dear God, I want to dedicate myself afresh to God once again to be used of God for the rest of the days of my life. I hope tonight that you will let God use you. How many of you would just make your way to this altar tonight? Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, I've tried my best to honor the Savior tonight. I sure want to, Lord. And I pray in Jesus' name that you'll speak to our hearts. Oh, God, I come to this altar myself tonight to dedicate myself to your friends. And I pray that Christ would be honored in my life all the days of my life. I want to serve you to the trumpet sounds and you take us home. While our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, I'm going to ask the piano to play. And God speak into your heart. Several have already made their way to the altar tonight. You say, Brother Alberson, I just want to slip out and come and spend a little time in the altar and, and dedicate my life afresh to God for God to use me. Oh, I know that many in this church, probably most in this church, give to missions. And I, I, I believe somehow I'm probably preaching to the choir tonight. Oh, this is my friend. My heart's desire, my prayer to God is that we'll just give ourselves wholly to the cause of Christ as those Macedonian believers did. First gave their own selves to the Lord, then unto us by the will of God. Do you need to come tonight? I hope that you will. God speaking, God moving. This is one time the service. We don't get in a hurry when God is moving and God is working. Let's let him do his perfect work tonight. Let him have his way in your heart and life. And I'll guarantee you this much, you will never regret it. As long as you live, you'll never regret what you do for the Savior. And one day in heaven, we'll see the results of the sacrifice of our giving and our going, and our praying. And I hope tonight the Spirit of the living God will continue to work in our hearts, both the will and the do of His good pleasure. Pastor, you come tonight as God bless you. Well, what a blessing, Lord. What a blessing on that. I can't tell you many, many years ago when I was in my life to go and do what God told me to do. Thank God. Burn them bridges and keep on going. Amen. And uh, have no problem preaching on giving. Have no problem preaching on surrendering and submitting. Because I did it many years ago. Amen. amen. But I found out something. It's a daily thing as well, too. Amen. amen. you got to submit yourself and surrender. And let God have his way. The wrong page, Bob. It's 276. Where are you 276, you saw. We're going to see a couple stanzas tonight. God has spoken to your heart. You need to come. Young person. Teenager. Come give your life to God, amen?
your son. You got some multi-billionaire son and everything. And he died on the way to the mission field, they say. And in his diary, he put down in that diary, no regrets. No regret. He didn't regret what he did. And I tell you, when you give to God, you don't lose, you gain. Amen. And I tell you, there's things that my wife and I have seen God do. We would have never seen the depths of God had we not been willing to go when he said to go. We've seen, we've seen God answer prayers. Amen. We've seen God met the needs. That first year in Germany, no support, any support, no health insurance, a baby on the way, you name it. And we saw God just meet our Amen. needs. And to this day, Tom said that's our favorite year of the mission over 20 years there was the first year. Because we see, we saw God just provide our needs. It wasn't American Express or Visa or MasterCard or debit cards that met our needs. It was God that met our needs. Amen. Amen. And aren't you glad that God's able? Amen. God's able to make all grace abound. Now, I know about you, I love that saving grace. I love that dying grace. But I like that living grace. Amen. Yeah. That God can just give it to you. You know what I'm saying? What a blessing, folks. Amen. All right. I appreciate that very much. And uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Wade and Dr. Alverson, for coming tonight and preaching the Word of God for us. Uh, now we appreciate that. You be praying what God will have you to do for worldwide missions. And uh, uh, and I think it's a, um, they're in Germany for years. We saw our faith promise go up every year, every year. And they're in the military church, unlike a civilian church in America, we had constant rotation. People were always coming and going, but it didn't make a difference. Our faith promise was still going up because it wasn't based upon who came and who left. It was based upon God. And Dr. Dr. Ray talked about that. Hey. You know, let me tell you, it's, not, it's a blessing. And I tell you, uh, he encouraged my heart tonight because just he got up there and tried to, you could just tell. He was just, he was in the zone. He was ready to go. Amen. Right. And uh, thank God for that. We appreciate that. All right, well, we're going to dismiss to the prayer. And uh, at this time, Brother Meyer, would you go back to this man, go back to your display. Preacher your Alfred, would you go back to your display as well in the back there? And as you walk out, I just let them know the wide seat of the display and everything and so forth. And uh, drive here, I saw several accidents today because of all this water and rain. So please drive here for going home. And by the way, good day, I got a phone call. Uh, Missy Melby, you know Missy Melby, she's joined our church. She had an accident coming back from Alabama, uh, seeing her mama. And uh, she... What I understand is that uh, a car was trying to cut her off or do something, and her car hydroplane and did two complete 360s in her two times in a row. Then she hit four trees and busted out all the glass in her car. And uh, she's wearing a neck brace, but I heard her in the background. Miss Teresa went up there tonight to see her, and I think she's supposed to be bringing her back. So pray for Missy that, uh, was it her mom or dad in Alabama? Her dad in Alabama, I'm sorry, not her mom, her dad in Alabama. So pray for her. Uh, according to what Miss Patrice has said, I've not got an update yet, but she said at about 5.30 today that she thinks she's going to be okay. But please do pray for her. And also Miss Amy, that didn't, she was here at church tonight, and also she was in the duo, so she went in and went back home. So do pray for Miss Amy and everything. And I tell you, pray for our church. Pray for the Green Baptist Church. We have the cottage prayer meetings. Every week for the last three weeks, just praying that God would meet the needs here of our church here. And uh, just pray. Just pray for God on that. And um, I'm seeing, even in a downward economy, God ain't broke. Amen. Amen. God, God can make a way. Amen. And so don't forget to go to the back at 730. Be here in your place and ask God to give us on that. And by the way, I want to tell you, too, and pick up all these offerings, because the offerings are going to be going to the expenses of the missionaries and also the conference and everything, and make sure you do it. I want to say thank you for all those that have given extra to take care of hotels and also take care of our food. We do appreciate that very much. Thank you very much for what you've done for us. We do appreciate that as well. Let's have a word of prayer and ask God to give us a good night tonight. Ask God to meet the needs as we can. And uh, Brother Leonard, would you please pray for Brother Leonard, please?